Hello, everyone. And welcome to Seattle. Actually, I, I live here, about half an hour north. And uh, I like to, to see a, a show of hands. I'm trying to figure out. I recognize many faces. Uh, please raise your hand if you are a practitioner, meaning you're not a coach, you're not a trainer, um, regardless if you are independent or if you work for a company like Teradata. So raise your hand. All right, good. Because I'm trying to understand you know, how to focus and where to put some accents in this presentation. Uh, there are probably at least a dozen folks in the room who could do this uh, very well, even better than I do. Um, we all have different voices, different characters. And uh, to get started here, the presentation is about leadership. At the end, we'll conclude what do I mean by trust leadership. I want to make it very clear from the beginning that I am not launching a new methodology. I am not coming up with a different leadership style. I will not write a book or try to sell you anything about it. It's literally trust leadership. Maybe it's trust leadership. Um, either way, I'm going to share with you what I have learned um, some of the things even over the past 10 years, some of them more recently. And speaking of trust, to make sure uh, you, know, you, you know who you're talking to, it's me. And I'm going to dive right into the Kanban method since we've had so many hands going up. Um, out of the folks who raise their hands as being practitioner, Please raise your hand if you have not taken a Kanban class yet. All right. So this is one of the things you learn when you go to class, that the Kanban method has change management principles, three of them. There used to be four. In the original Blue Book, if you've read it, there are four. Uh, there is still kind of the fourth one right now is rolled into here, respecting existing roles, responsibility, and job titles. At some point... Uh, it, you know, upon a revision, this was moved uh, under one, as, as it reflects better as one principle of start with what you do now, right? And you're probably at least um, familiar with the practices of Kanban. I'm not going to discuss them one by one. What I want to do instead is to look at three things. I think Klaus gave me this clicker on purpose. All right. Oh. I have to be close to the, uh, to the sender. OK, so I want to look at uh, a couple of things in this context. So we have the Kanban method. The third change management principle of the Kanban method, method encourages that we all take acts of leadership, regardless of the level we're at, right? Now, at the bottom. When we talk about continuous improvement, one of the practices highlights that we should be using the scientific method. So I have been teaching and coaching literally all over the world. The last training engagement was I was actually working for Teradata, and I trained about, I, I don't know, I, I think it was over somewhere between six and 800 people around the world. And I'll tell you that. You know, very bright people at Terada, very bright people everywhere you go. Somehow, sometimes, people shake their heads when they hear about the scientific method. Maybe they make an assumption. Maybe they think what it is, maybe they don't. But I don't get a lot of questions. So just as a tip for the trainers and the coaches in the room, when you are uh, going about teaching or training, it's a good idea to specify and to touch on what the scientific method is. So that's why it's highlighted, because it does seem to me that's a little bit of, of space of confusion with students. However, if you don't understand what the scientific method is and how the scientific method works, guess what? You're going to have challenges establishing these acts of leadership at all levels. So that's how these things, three things are related. And that's how um, this part of the conversation we're going to have. Now, Next, we're going to talk about the essence of Kanban, maybe the essence of the Kanban method. Again, if you have been through classes, uh, LKU 
classes, you have probably seen this picture, yeah? If you haven't, uh, at least if you have the book and you read the book, it's on the cover of the book, right? Now, for the people that have been through classes, what is the question that the instructor or you as, as, a, as a trainer usually ask? How many acts of leadership do we see in this picture? Now, um, and you know kind of what the answers are, yeah? If you teach a public class, if you are in an environment where you have people coming from all over different companies, different cultures, different habits of work, different styles of leadership, you're going to hear two answers. There is one act of leadership or there are four acts of leadership, right? It's very interesting when you teach private classes where you work with people from the same culture because you typically get only one of the two. You get a definite, of course, there's only one act of leadership. If you are more like, uh, that's kind of like more like Midwest, maybe East Coast, it depends. I'm not hastily generalizing anything, but I've made some observations. If you're more on the West Coast, more down South in California, you're gonna hear, oh, there's four. Yeah? Says the guy with the flip flops. Anyway, um, so, so, so literally leadership is about perception. And the essence of leadership here, um, sorry. Oops, there we go. Uh, leadership, the way, the way I coach, the way I train, the way I encourage people to practice Kanban is that leadership is an act, is an action, is not a position. And, and, and it's sometimes I refer to it as just-in-time leadership. I will show you examples of just-in-time leadership, how it happens, and you'll recognize it right away. What else? So now we're going to try and put things together. So we have this essence of Kanban. We have this way in which we use visual boards. We have the foreground. We have the background. Obviously, we focus on the background, not on the foreground, which is in opposition to other methods, right? We don't focus on people to make sure they're utilized. We focus on the flow of work that we see on Kanban boards. We use the scientific method. And that's the blank stare in some people's eyes. Not in here, I, I know. But like when, when you teach, right? Like I can really look into their eyes. So it's good to have a model. This is just a model. I just, I just literally, um, I, got, I got this off the internet. Um, it's pretty much, it starts with a question. Then you figure out what you want to improve, right? You conduct experiments, and there's going to be some learning lessons. Either you're going to confirm your assumptions, or you're going to infirm them, or you're going to repeat the experiments to make sure that what you see is, is really true. Like, have we really eliminated a backlog that 12 months ago was growing? <laughs> I'm not sure you can replicate that, but if you get there, it worked, okay? Um, and then, based on these changes, Klaus, thank you, nice clicker. Uh, I have mine, I, it was discharged, it's my fault. So then we implement the changes that, that we learned from our experimentation with our systems. Um, so again, something to point out. And I learned this. This is something new I started to tell people and I started to present and I started to research more and figure out how to, how to implement, how to support acts of leadership. And I've learned this while I was at, at Teradata and we were going around the world training so many people. What happens is, you go to spend one or two or four days with people who are actually should be chargeable, right? They're taken off, taking, taken off consulting engagements to be in a class to learn this new methodology, this new um, agile approach to deliver analytics and data warehousing solutions, right? What do they expect most of the times? You give me something, you give me a tool, you tell me what to do, and I'm done, yeah? It's not just a Teradata, it's anywhere. And we actually were scratching our heads as, as instructors after the first couple of pilot classes. Because we had to make it clear up front and to tell people and to help them understand that we're talking about a method. While we are providing uh, Swift Kanban licenses, while we're going to train them on how to use Swift Kanban to create their own boards, 
the method does not provide them with the answers they, they, they seeking, it will help them to ask the right questions. So where do the answers come from? Well, you can fill in the blanks the last line. Answers emerge as a result of experimentation. That's what I've had initially. Um, answers emerge as a result, as a result of experimenting with the practices of Kanban, the practices of Scrum, the practices of whatever method you use, right? And for the purpose of this presentation, I didn't try to be clever. I'm, I'm very transparent and honest. What do we do with those experiments? It's literally about enabling these acts of leadership. And remember, when I say leadership, I do not refer to a position. I refer to an attitude. I refer to a role. When I go to certain countries, that are very top-down command and control. I don't use the word leadership, I use the word ownership. Yeah? So we have to adapt also in our delivery as coaches and trainers. Make sense? So moving on, I will show you some examples. I have three examples. Um, one is the anatomy of an engagement, the way I conduct it. I'm not here to preach, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to share with you what has worked for me. What I found out that works. Feel free to ask questions. I'm here the whole week. I'm very open, very transparent. I have nothing to hide. I have everything to share. Um, if you like it, if you think it helps you, ask me questions. So there's going to be the anatomy of an engagement, which, by the way, follows literally what you learn in the Lean Kanban University classes. I'm not, again, coming up with something and not trying to sell you something uh, different or anything else. We're going to talk about the genesis of Kanban. Where, where did it actually, how did it start and how is it relates to this concept of just-in-time leadership? And, and something else about the past 10 years, all from the perspective and the view of just-in-time leadership. So the anatomy of an engagement You learn, um, if you take the class, you learn about static. How many people are familiar? Systems thinking approach to introducing Kanban. Yeah? A series of exercises. You can adapt those exercises. We adapted those exercises at Teradata for data warehousing and, and business analytics. Um, you start with training. I start with training. So I will conduct one or two or more sessions where we're going to teach Kanban. We're going to teach these change management principles, the practices. We're going to show examples. We're going to play the Get Kanban game. How many people have played Get Kanban game? As you get out the door, there's a gentleman with two huge monitors by him. His name is Russell Healy. He is the actual, the first per he is actually the one who developed the Get Kanban game. So talk to him about that. Um, so during the first day, we, we cover the theory we play the game and we reflect on how, how the, the lessons from the game and how actually people playing the game are learning hands-on how to apply the principles of Kanban because they used it in the game for four, four hours. By the way, I have to ask this. How many people took the class with me? Okay. How did the game work for you? What do you think? Okay. Yeah. How is it different at work when you start as a Kanban initiative? Exactly the same. Yeah? It's just that the experience, I'm sorry? He said, uh, he said sorry, uh, he said that in the beginning when you play the game, it's very uncomfortable. And as instructors, you kind of do that on purpose. We tell you the rules, you don't repeat them a whole lot. I actually, I have a colleague, a former colleague from Teradata who insisted to, to create um, artifacts that we put on the table. People, people are, there's nothing wrong with that, it's fine. Whatever works for you, do it. Um, I do have some artifacts. I, I also learned that with certain audiences, I do need to have some artifacts. Here is the reason why I don't give a lot of information. I want people to experience that difficulty in the beginning. Why? Because throughout the game, they're going to repeat the same steps and processes iteratively for 13 days. Once they go through this process three or four times, not, only, not one single person at the table knew everything about the game. But when they start to figure things out, when, oh, I forgot how 
we do this, then he's on my team, you know, we're on the same team, he's going to say, well, hold on, this is what this means. So there are these acts of collaboration that give, that build up your personal trust. You need to build up your personal, your trust in yourself before someone else can trust you. As you build trust in yourself, as the team starts to build trust, working with each other and seeing the value that each other person adds, you're enabling these acts of leadership at all levels. You're enabling this just-in-time leadership. That's, that's really a, a great point of, um, you know, we make with teaching the game, okay? We, we kind of reflect on, uh, after the game is over, and at the end of the game, folks are, people are experts. At, at using Kanban, at using these practices, these principles and practices, right? And we reflect, and one of the questions I say, you know, how did you feel at the beginning of the game? Sometimes I may point out, as I explain the rules, kind of like I, I look over the class and say, you guys, it looks in here like I'm the headlight and, and you're the deer. And then at the end of the game, I remind them about that comment. How do you feel now? We got it. Okay? So the point is that when you go back to work on Monday, you know the, the saying in, we have, when you go back after the class to implement Kanban, you're going to go through that same experience. There will be a lot of deer in the headlights. Maybe your headlights, maybe you'll be one of the deer in someone else's headlights. You won't know. And that's why our first principle is start is what you do now. Actually, the key word there is start. Get going. And get going with your team, not on your own. More on that uh, later. So again, we're talking about the anatomy of an engagement. We start with training on the first day of the game. On the second day, we move on to static exercises. You may recognize that the inside out and the outside in feedback, right? Tell me what prevents your team. What do you believe that prevents you from, from uh, having, uh, being more effective? What slows you down? And then the other one is what feedback do you get from your customers? Based on that, in a, uh, I can do that in a private class for obvious reasons. You don't have everybody there from a value stream. In a, in, a, in, a, let's say, in a public class, you cannot do it. In a private class, in a private class, I structure it in such a way that I have enough people from a whole value stream. So if this person here is a customer, and the customer has a request that goes into a system, into a, a system of knowledge workers, at some point, it's going to get something back. Over here, you see three teams. These are all the teams, all the entities, the, the silos, where all the work for this one persona goes through. So we go through these exercises. I'm not going to explain the whole thing. We're going to identify the work item types, the deliverables. What do we give this person? We may have some data. Again, you're not going to have this in a public class if you're teaching as, as, as an instructor. Um, if, you are, uh, if you do this on your own, it's best to have some data. You want to find out what have we delivered last month. Moreover, you want to, to have some data about your delivery rate, about your capability rate, um, and about the distribution of these numbers, yeah? You've probably heard enough about data and how to use data to make better decisions today. But again, here, we're not explaining all these concepts. I'm just trying to go through the anatomy of an engagement. Next, we work on the workflow. This is the workflow that, if you've read the, you know, the blue book, the Kanban book, this is chapter four, the XIT story. That's what I had on my whiteboard at Microsoft in 2004. Uh, trying to understand how work was flowing. You define your work item cards. Um, over here, there are a lot of blockers, so you identify, you know, we want to, to identify the cards that are blocked. You're going to build your board um, one step at a time. And then you start through this essence of Kanban, where you have these conversations. You have this collaboration, where you literally have everybody participating is a distinct and just-in-time act of leadership. Why is it just-in-time? Because it happens in front of the board in a stand-up meeting every day. Make sense? And finally, um, what I do as a coach, here, we're designing the board. At some point, we have a board on the wall. In the next step, I ask the team to populate the board with the work in progress. Make sense? Yeah? In this coaching process, teams need time. And I will show you in this coaching, the way I do coaching engagements, they're usually three or four months. And I'm one week on, one week off. I never spend more than two weeks a month with a client. I never spend two consecutive weeks with a client unless we have a lot of training to do. 
guess what happens sometimes? You come back and they haven't put anything on the board. I'll show you why in a, in a future slide. Now, as the team is doing this, the last part for me is to actually create a structure of different boards. And you may hear while you're at the conference about upstream Kanban, downstream Kanban. Um, I create leadership boards for the CEO and the direct reports. I create boards at different levels so the organization can make better decisions. Um, depending on the electronic tool that you use, these boards are, they communicate with each other, right? So you can tell what is, it's like a, a parent-child relationship. So let's move on to an actual um, example. So here is one of these boards that was created. And what you see here, the three lanes, they picked three different teams. So we're going to focus on one. This is the team that started right away. Uh, the team in the middle was about months or so later. The other one, the third one, was another month later after the second team. What did we start with? Well, I left on Friday and said, OK, guys, start to put your cards on the board. See this number here? I get a phone call, like I think Wednesday, from the CTO saying, Drago, you have a problem. Uh, we're, we, we ran out of sticky notes. <laughs> so he didn't actually attempt to put any sticky notes yet. He was, he was trying to be funny. We developed, you know, we developed a really good relationship. And he said, you know, I, don't believe, I can't believe this. I've been CTO here like over seven years. I can't believe this team of like less than 30 people has 2,000 things in progress. Some of them 40 years old. Some of them for things that we decommissioned a long time ago. I see a lot, some heads shaking. You see this? It's unmanageable, right? So what happened was I said, okay, well, um, you know, we, we set up a session. We looked at it you know, and said, clean it up. Get, get your team together and clean it up. At some point, the team got to 24. See, this is when the process, they established the process. By the way, you don't, you're not going to see 24 here. The team is working between these arrows. Their commitments start here and end here. And if you look here, you're going to be able to count six parking spots. One, two, three, four, five, six by four. One, two, three, four. That's 24. It's a physical limit on their board. And it's an upper limit. They say we can't have more than 24 at any given point in time. If they have less, there's nothing wrong with that. Now let's look at the results. As a parenthesis, um, new coaches and new trainers, and sometimes they bring case studies to show. And they talk about the emotional part. They talk about... How, how well, the, you know, how much the team likes Kanban. And when I ask them about results and improvements, they're like, oh, we haven't really tracked that. I can't tell you how many successful, potentially successful Kanban initiatives I have seen that stopped or people redirected to something else because people remove, people usually like in higher positions, remove from the team, they were asking for data and say, well, we, we don't really have any data. But we're doing things faster. They were, you know, we're removing blockers. They were but they had no way to show it. Don't get carried away with the emotional uh, and the moral benefits from Kanban because you'll find them pretty quick. Track baseline, track your improvements, and share them uh, with everybody in the organization. Now, something interesting. Um, the data here, I only collected data for the weeks when I was there. So actually, I was there over four months. I was there like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks. Um, and at some point, the team starts to show improvement, and you see improvements here going up, and then they go down. Well, the reason they went down is because they got so productive. So they go from 12 to 13, they go to about close to 49, 59 in total, where you have break fix issues with a lighter color and features with a darker color. Um, so they get to about 60, and what happens we found out that actually we, we got so overproductive. The initial board looked, like, looked nothing like this. This is, this is one build in one week that the team delivers. Um, that we took about half of the team and we put them on that third row here at the bottom to do something else. And what you see here are the results of half of the initial team. So half of this whole team here now delivers at this level. Uh, I can work, I know, I hope the, you know, people who are specialists in data are not here. Uh, I need to improve this to show you some more details, but I think it's, it's making a good point, right? Uh, it's interesting from a data analysis perspective, when we were here, I pointed out something that showed 
Remember the static exercises? Where I have all those, the whole value stream saying, you know, what prevents us and, you know, what the deliver. It was all about quality. So I said, well, obviously you have a quality problem. 50% of your work is fixing the work you deployed last week. It's interesting that as the team got more productive, the ratio between break-fix issues and features did not change while the average pretty much remained very, very close to the different pattern, right? So a lot of times we can jump to the wrong conclusion. Why? Because we try to measure too much over a too short period of a time. Improvements take time. Observe. Again, it's an example of just-in-time leadership, right? Acknowledge that you made a mistake, you made an assumption, right? We were assuming, as productivity was going up, we were assuming 50% defects, also because quality was an issue for every single team, including the customer, yeah? So you're constantly learning. If you're constantly learning, if it's continuous learning, then leadership, the acts of leadership have to be continuous as well. But it's more like just-in-time. So. Um, now I'm going to show you, you see the same board, these are the folks, and you see um, the manager, that's, that's the senior, senior manager and architect for the product, and he has his hand on that top row, and you see at the bottom already, we started, we took about half, this is half of the team that initially I had in stand-up meetings, um, and they work on that bottom row. So how does this really work? Well, it starts, it starts with someone, in this case, someone in Ukraine, who says, you know, I, I, I'm really stuck. We've had, a, we've had an error, we deployed to production, we have a problem, I can fix it, I'm stuck. Right at the beginning of the, the meeting, someone else says, well, I, I need some help. I'm also, I also have one of those blockers on the board. And another, this is another person who's a senior. He's, he's a manager of different subset. Overall, the guy who's standing is like the, the overall manager. Uh, he reports to the CTO. Someone else who has a very broad range of experience says, you know, I can help, but we have to reprioritize my work. So these are very, really good conversations. Before, he would just drop something to go and spend a couple of hours with someone else. By him dropping whatever he was doing, he was now blocking something else, or he was going to delay something else that was not communicated and understood by their customers. The customer of this team are these three people here, where this guy is the lead, and they're on a different floor. The reason why they are in this stand-up meeting is because whatever happens on this different floor, 30% of that work has to go through here. This 30% of the work that goes through here is all the escalations they have from customers. So it's very important to him to not have delay, to keep his promises, right? And, and this is software for restaurant and for hospitality industry. You know, if you cannot accept um, a gift card, if you're behind the counter at Panera, and I'm coming with a gift card, and you can't accept it, it's not good, right? It has to be fixed right away. So that's one example. All right. So, so now the manager says, let's focus on value, referring to this guy, John, the customer, like the, the, the person who represents the customers. And this guy says, I never thought this would happen. Now, I want to point something to you in this picture. Do these people look engaged? Yeah. Do you know what I was seeing that first month? Remember the first month when productivity was really down? <coughs> Completely different look on everybody's face. It was kind of like this. <laughs> Make me do this. Yeah, right? <laughs> Nobody would come in front of the board. Nobody would answer any questions. So as a coach and as, as, as a trainer, you have to have some resilience or a little bit of thick skin because you have to understand, nobody does it with, with bad intentions. Nobody's trying to insult you. We're not going to cover here resistance to change and why we do this, but we have a lot to lose when there are changes. Maybe, maybe communication is not that great. Um, we all make mistakes, right? But there was, there was just your, that's what I would refer to as that um, initial resistance that you kind of expect to have. This is probably about a month and a half later. Why are so engaged? Because you already see the results in productivity. You made your point as a coach, as a trainer, as a sponsor. You get to that point where productivity jumps up, where you start to deliver uh, things like five or six times faster. Everybody's paying attention. It's like, OK, we got something here.
All right, so, so, so this just keeps going and gets better. You know, okay, uh, the test manager says, Let's me, let me explain the impact to test. Now, here is the million dollar question. And this is the million dollar question from the guy with the blue shirt up front. He is a, a VP and he owns everything that goes through that top lane. He owns the product. And his question is, uh, hold on a second. Why does this problem happen again? It's not the first time, and we see it all the time. Pause. Remember the quality issues that kept coming up? This is one of them. So they keep going and, and, and fixing a problem without trying to understand, or they, there is no time. They had no time to fix the root cause. So here is the million dollar answer that's going to come also from another person in Ukraine. And let me know when you're done reading that. So pretty much what he says, well, uh, Dimitar, if you can understand, don't say anything, because it's, it's probably, yeah, it's my understanding of Ukrainian, OK? Uh, but pretty much what, what he means to say there is, we wouldn't have this problem if we would have had proper JIRA workflow training. They have a lot of automated workflows in JIRA. These guys in the room, they build them. They know them by heart. They made some assumptions. And even if they show the folks in Ukraine, they're a fairly new team. Um, I think there's about eight, or about eight people at the time. They train them real fast over video. You know, so they're missing something there. They're missing some steps in the build process. Yeah. How easy is it to fix something like that? Come on, anybody. What would you do to prevent this from happening again? Anybody? Maybe you create a checklist. <laughs> yeah, the checklist refers some procedures that are documented. So if you have someone new, it's easy for them to follow. See, and it's literally what we did. And it's also the reason why you saw the quality improve. That's the reason why we stopped having 50% of work being actually rework. 50%, I'm sorry, 50% of the capability of the team. Make sense? Again, acts of leadership everywhere. This is what you want to get to. And we'll talk uh, in an upcoming slide what you want to avoid. Uh, really quick on the genesis. Many of you have seen this picture. You may recognize someone there. Um, it's, it's the story at Microsoft. And some artifact that actually I haven't seen for a very, very long time, actually for about 10 years, and I just uncovered, is this white paper. So back then, there was no Kanban method, OK? It is 2005. There is no Kanban method. We literally looked at a team of people that on, they have a mandate to deliver. Everything they deliver should be delivered in less than 30 days. And yet, they deliver nothing short of five months, about 150 days maybe. So we're not going through the case study. We reached this improvement where at some point everything was done. Same people doing the same type of work. They're doing it now in 21 days or less. It was between four and 21 days. Commitment, clear. We eliminated the backlog somewhere around here. It happened really fast. So. Um, I also have a, a, a bit here because a lot of times people are asking, you know, how, how did I meet David? Um, I'll tell you how. The name of the team I was managing, the folks you've seen in the picture, was called the Agile team. Agile was still not very popular, actually it was not popular at all at Microsoft in 2004. So I went with a colleague to Barnes & Noble and we asked the nice lady who greeted us there to do a search on Agile and management. Ta-da! came up with this book, Agile Management, yeah, by David Anderson. Had no idea who he was. Apparently, he was not, you know, he was from, some, from Europe, and, and he worked in some other companies. And one thing led to another. Then I also subscribed to every distribution list for Agile. And I see an email from A. David Anderson saying that he was going to give a talk about a theory of constraints at the American Society for Quality, which was across the street from the Microsoft building I was working in right here in Redmond. So I went to the talk, and the rest is history. I said, hey, you know, I really love the concept of theory of constraints being applied to software engineering, but yet mm, there was nothing in his book about anyone applying it. I said, you know, can you come and help us with this drum buffer rope? Because you're not really sure if you should go to West Marine and buy a bunch of rope, and we should go to the guitar center and buy a drum. It's like, 
So that's how the, the friendship started. And that's why you're here today. Instant acts of leadership. You don't know how to do something. Be happy, don't panic. Ask for help. Buy a book. You know, go to a class, take a conference. Again, but this is, this is the genesis of Kanban. And now you know. How about this? If, uh, if we talk to an executive, and about six months ago, I was actually in, in, a CIO, in CIO shoes and seat, and we did have an SAP implementation in Eastern Europe. And if someone comes to you and says, you know, uh, okay, vendor, how would you manage delivery of this $11 million SAP implementation project? You know, we have a pretty strong PMO. We figured out a couple of things. We think there's going to be, oops, yeah, I'm giving it away. But there's going to be about $2 million worth of work in progress per week. How are you going to manage that? How are you going to assure me yeah, that we get things done? and all the dependencies and everything else is taken care of. What if the vendor says, oh, hold on. I have this on a napkin somewhere. Guess what? It's been done. Hmm? How would you hold daily meeting with more than 30 people? And typically, when, when you get to these situations, and it's not, it's not how work was getting done in Eastern Europe, trust me. Uh, and the project failed three times. That was before I even got there. Um, do we know anyone who worked there, were they able to do it again? So very interesting from the concept of leadership, from the concept of like this just-in-time leadership and, and the history of Kanban and why you're here and what you can do. Is this really about your potential? Because you all have this potential. I would give it to you in writing that everybody in this room has more experience, probably more education than I've had in 2004 when I was at Microsoft. Okay? Maybe you have not all been trained as professional stuntmen. Maybe that's where I got some of these ideas. They say, no, nothing is impossible. Let's do the crazy thing, you know. Uh, but I've never got injured as a stuntman either. So let's look at what these people accomplished over these past 10 years after they successfully delivered that SAP implementation. So you know David, he actually wrote more books than I, I collected screenshots for. Here is another one, Dan Vacanti. I know Dan, I don't think he's here this week. So Dan Vacanti uh, has um, also a good book on um, agile metrics. And a local, another local, Dominica, Dominica de Grandes. Um, familiar with the name in the book? Yeah. They work there. Dominica is now a staple at every DevOps conference, right, and does training and she works, you know, she pretty much, she's the one who introduced actually Gene Kim and a lot of folks to, to, to Kanban. Yeah. Really, this slide is about you. It's about your potential for just-in-time leadership. It's your potential for where you could be in five or in ten years from now, where you could be next year with one project. I've met so many people here, uh, probably in, I don't know, um, it's more than six years ago. And I, raise your hand if you wrote a book. Alexei, raise your hand. <laughs> Don't worry about the question. Yeah. OK, there you go. There's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good potential. You don't need anybody's permission. Give yourself permission to make just-in-time acts of leadership. They're right in front of you. They're easy. So let's look at some patterns. And probably I need to write how much time do I have? 10 minutes. OK, good. All right, just in time, some leadership patterns. Now, I, I wrote this as narratives. Of course, there's a lot more behind, but here is one. We focus on the work being done. It's a leadership pattern. I'm not waiting for someone to come and tell me what to do. Why? Because I have been equipped. I can look at the board. I know what to pull next based on the priorities that we're all aligned on. Hmm? If I am a manager, if I am a leader, I can see the blockers. I can say, how can I help? Who do, I, who do we need to talk to? Yeah? We are committed to improve delivery of our services. Whether or not those services are fit for purpose, it's a different conversation, it's a different book, it's a different skill. But this is what we do. This is what we want to do. And we keep learning and we're learning, right? 
we improve the delivery of services, is actually we want to create this permission for pool systems, what I explained earlier. We want to be able for anyone in the organization to pool, to know what is the next thing they can help, they can add value to. When I started with the team, with that Agile team at Microsoft in 2004, I was working about 16 hours a day for about three months. What was I doing most of the time? It was learned behavior from the previous managers of the team. Tell everybody what to do. Then I went to India for three weeks. And probably another couple of weeks after that, I realized that I would not tell anyone anything about what to do. And this was after David, uh, we limited the work in progress. So you, um, not sure if I, I didn't show that slide yet, right? So we went to about 10 things per person and we had very clear criteria on what they can start when and on what they can start working on. Why did they have over 60 to 90 things in progress for six people? Because everything they would start working on did not have enough information for them to do anything. They had to send emails. Why were they taking on average um, five months to deliver anything? They were spending 40% of their time sending emails, emails that nobody would answer to because they were busy. By the way, if we go back a step here, our common leadership acts are focused on the work being done and not on the people doing the work. What is the anti-pattern? There is an anti-pattern here that we can summarize in one dirty word. That we all got successful and we all build careers doing it. It's called utilization. Is that what, sorry, I should have, yeah. Utilization makes sure that everybody's busy. What is your boss pay, why is your boss paying for those of you that the boss paid for you to be here? What is the boss paying for? What do they want? What does the organization want? More productivity. Yet, we measure utilization. You know what, maybe if we want to improve productivity, uh, we should track productivity. And we should track the reasons that prevent productivity from having different parameters, yeah? All right, uh, the KPIs. Again, you have to have some KPIs, very simple. I don't think, there is absolutely not, I don't think. There's absolutely no methodology in the world that has such results and has such simple KPIs. Right? What are they? What's the most important one, probably, in my mind? Hmm? Lead time. And then, what do you find out? You find out how long it takes you to do something. Then the next thing you want to find out is what? Why does it take so long? Which is flow efficiency. And when you find that flow efficiency is a single digit, you should cry of joy. Because you can double it, you can triple it if it's a single digit. You'll never reach 100%. Certain teams will never get past 30 or 40%, especially like engineering and new product development. Operation teams can get to 80%, right? But think about it, you go from a single digit, from like five to nine. Hmm? That's your potential. That's your potential for what you can do to optimize processes end to end. So, in conclusion, again, the pattern is that we are on this, we use a scientific method of experimentation, of learning, and of making decisions together to understand what slows down our services. I was careful when I, when, when, as over time, as I wrote and edited these things. There's nothing about people there. Everything is about work. If you make it about people, you're creating anti-patterns. You're eroding trust. Eroding trust, trust in myself, trust in my teams, trust in each other, and you're eroding our potential for just-in-time leadership. We're going to wait for someone to tell us what to do. And when something doesn't work, we're going to smile. What do you want me to do next? It's a good place to be in. Six-figure salary, I don't need to worry about a thing. I heard this literally from people. There's nothing wrong with the culture. They think. And they think it's impossible to change it. And yet, I think we have proven the opposite. We can change it. We have to change ourselves. We have to show. Is Mike Blaha here? Blaha? In the room? Anyway, uh, 
What do you think would happen if you start to use some of these principles and practices, even without formal training, and you reduce delivery of an operating system from two months, from two years, to less than three months? Do you think someone is going to pay attention? You betcha. You think that someone is going to promote you? You betcha. I'm using that because he's from Minneapolis, okay? So, uh, you betcha, I mean. Uh, so, you think someone will want to roll this out? Is, the lady, is anybody from Optum here? Optum? United Healthcare? I know she's having a presentation. Um, go watch that presentation. They, they, I bet they have a beautiful story. Uh, it ended up with a department of 10,000 people doing amazing things with Kanban. Yeah? Okay. Uh, which style of leadership? We're pretty much almost done. Which style of leadership would you follow now that we know these things? Here is one. This style of leadership believes that power comes from a position of authority. Hmm? Yeah? You like it? You ready? You ready? You ready to sign up? Okay. Or power is greatest in a collective team. And so on. Deliver the approved solution to the team. Okay. Uh, professionals here. Coaches, professional, it doesn't matter. Kanban agile. Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Okay. So keep your hand up. Look around everybody else. All right, so let me ask you a question. I, I haven't rehearsed, I haven't asked this question before. How many times you get a client who tells you exactly what they want you to do? Hey, here's, here's some folks from Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's all, that's all you can do up there. Uh, dramatizing, okay? They want a playbook. They want a tool. They want everybody certified, which is good news. Yeah, it's, it's good. But I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't take any coaching. I wouldn't make any coaching commitments to them. Hmm? What happens when you leave? Everything stops. Why? Because it's yours. Why? Because it's not theirs. Why? Because they didn't build it. Why? Because you build it. Why? Because they're not trusted. Ha! Huh. I need someone to come and do something to these bums so they can work faster. <laughs> Kind of dramatizing again. Sorry, I get carried away towards the end of my presentations. Maybe I'm going low on sugar. I don't know. <laughs> so what is the opposite of delivering the approved solution to the team? Um, so I, and, and I, you know, recently, so I got recently something like that, right? So, and, and the thing is that the organization is going through some changes. They want to do better. So I said, okay, great. You know, thank you for the template. You know, and I also failed. I should have volunteered. I should have volunteered the different approach up front. The thing is, I haven't had it quite ready yet. I was working on it. And, and they were moving so fast, they sent me what they wanted me to do before I had a chance to tell them what I propose we do. Which is another saying I really like a lot. If you don't take initiative, meaning if you're not going to do something, you're gonna have to do what, something else, uh, what someone else wants you to do. Right? So you have to be quick. Again, just in time, leadership acts. So what's the opposite of this? Right? We facilitate brainstorming with the team. It's a different style of leadership. Let's call a spade a spade. These are acts of leadership. You can call them principles, practices, methods. At the end of the day, you have someone has to do something about it. You telling me I'm a zero or I'm out of time? Okay. All right. So by the same, on this side, we have we fight fires and focus on symptoms versus seeking to uncover the root causes of issues. <coughs> I have used this image before in different contexts and presentations. I adapted it a little bit because the interaction between people is the same. Whether you have traditional leadership, whether you have, I used to call the thing on the right, um, I was director of an agile practice, so I, I call that you know, agile leadership. It doesn't matter, I'm not stealing, uh, I'm upfront about it, I'm not doing something else. I'm calling it right now, I'm still calling this traditional, I'm calling it just in time because I want to make a point for you. I want to inspire you to have this attitude and, and to build this attitude with the people you interact with. And to ask yourself the question, how can I build this just-in-time uh, leadership attitude? So I'm having a closing metaphor for which uh, I figured I should use a legal disclaimer. In, well, I'm not very good at legal disclaimer, so instead I wrote the definition of a metaphor. Okay. So um, we're talking about leadership, and this, this is, again, the closing and the part 
coming back to the title. So we're going to focus on the first part of the word leadership. Yeah? Guys, so it's late in the day, you know, it, it, you, we're going to need to take a break eventually. Can you say led? Can you say leadership? Thank you. So, you know when you, a song gets in your head and then you can't get it off for the whole week? I don't want leadership and lead to get out of your head the whole week, okay? Make, make jokes about it. Come about is your own thing. Now, I have nothing. I, I have been in leadership roles. I have full respect for leadership. And if you take two classes with me, you know it starts with assume good intentions. We have to make decisions. If someone is not giving me information, I'm in a position in a leadership role, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to figure out later how to recover. And I'm not really the kind of pushing things down people's throat. Um, so it's still going to be cooperative. But if nobody, you know, if I have to encourage this, even that is an act of, of, of courage because I'm willing to make some mistakes that later I'm going to acknowledge. That's also powerful. So either way, you don't, you know, I don't think you have anything to, 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 um, to lose. Now, when, if we refer to lead, and again, to make the point here, Lead can come from many different ways, and it weighs down. It slows down leadership. So when I say uh, in the beginning title, let's find the lead together, uh, I did not mean let's find the lead together. Maybe the title looks funny to you, but now I hope it doesn't. So let's find the lead together. Let's take the lead out of leadership, not, and assuming good intentions is not because leadership is doing something wrong. It's because with every act of just-in-time leadership, we collect different data, we enable different behaviors, and we provide a different answer that helps all of us in the organization to make better decisions. Uh, someone in my last, in the last train the trainer class, we had at LKU uh, who kind of Dibbles with graphic things, send me this, and I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start using it. I've been using Weightlifter for a while, but, but this is me. Um, oops. Okay. 